Good evening. Welcome to the virtual Christmas Eve worship service for December 24th, 2020. It is my great privilege to offer up a, a great many readings with um, some wonderful music in between. Uh, our first selection is the hymn, Bethlehem, Hallelujah, that was first recorded December 24, 2017.
the journey. We shouldn't have ever gone, but it being our first Christmas as empty nesters made us want to be somewhere we had family. My wife was insistent that we spend this Christmas with our daughter in a small town in northern Minnesota. Despite my constant checks on the impending weather fronts, Donna busied herself with last minute baking and gift shopping and wrapping and packing. I was not getting through to this woman. So it was, as I loaded the car and she loaded the back seat with a couple extra blankets and our snow boots, we headed out in what was just a light dusting on Christmas Eve early that morning. As we traveled and reminisced about the Christmases past when our children were home, my apprehensions began to lessen. We would be okay, I thought. As we traveled north to the cities and the afternoon turned a little gray, that voice in the back of my head kept speaking a little louder and a little louder. We were no more than two hours north of the cities when my fears were realized. The snow had been increasing for the last three hours and now a wind had begun making visibility poor and driving conditions even worse. When the highway patrol pulled the gates across the highway and directed us off the nearest exit, we were lost. We knew our approximate location, but a town with housing was not to be found, even if we could see it. Without hesitation, as we passed through a small town, my wife directed me to stop at a small house nestled amongst pine trees with a barn set back from the house. Malcolm, if you can make it in the drive, I believe this is where the Lord wants us to stay tonight. My mouth dropped open to give her a rebuttal and a peace of my mind about this crazy trip. But my eyes burnt from the strain of trying to see through the snow swirling ahead of the headlights and, well, I knew was it was an argument that would go nowhere. So I maneuvered the car in the drive and came to stop where I could go no further from the depth of the snow. Donna reached back and grabbed her snow boots, slipped them on, and bounded out of the car and up to the house. I had rolled down my window to hear her and still struggled to get into my snow boots. A back light went on and I could hear a man's voice sounding a little less than hospitable. There were a few more words spoken when I looked up to see Donna running back to the car, motioning me to come in. My heart sank. What, we were, what were we about to get ourselves into? <clears throat> I opened the door, grabbed the blankets and an overnight bag, and headed toward my wife. She grabbed my arm and drew me near her and said, don't worry, Malcolm, I know everything will be fine. The older man we met in his bib overalls, leathered old face, and sad expression understood our situation somewhat begrudgingly. Our host, Arnie, was sole caregiver to his blind and memory impaired wife, Cora. So as Arnie ushered us into the living room where Cora sat, his words were few and to the point, just don't upset his wife. Donna and Malcolm are here, dear, Arnie said as he bent to brush a few gray strands of hair from her face. Cora clasped her hands together and exclaimed with pure joy in her voice how good it was to have us home. Donna played along with all of Cora's inquiries as if we had known them all our lives. We assured her children, we assured her children were fine and yes, we enjoyed our jobs 
and it would be another 10 years before we could even think of retiring. Arnie brought us hot chocolate and let us know that no one had slept upstairs in a while. But he was certain the bedding was clean and showed us where the bathroom was. Before we went up to our room, Donna bent down and gave Cora a kiss goodnight. Somehow, my incorrigible wife had found a friend in the middle of a snowstorm. The next morning, the smell of coffee and bacon bombarded our senses as we came down from our room. Cora sat at the table, a big smile on her face, beckoning us to come and eat, and we did. Both Donna and I were famished. After breakfast, Arnie and I went outside to dig the car out, leaving Donna to clean up the kitchen and keep Cora company. When Arnie and I returned into the house, on the kitchen table set two gifts in faded Christmas wrap. Donna asked that I get the gift bag in the back seat and bring it in. So it was on that Christmas morning that we exchanged Christmas gifts with people we had never met. Our gifts had, had, been, had been tucked away for quite some time, for the creases in my new pajamas would probably always be there, and Donna's new perfume was distinctively dark. Donna had been on a crocheting binge and had made an afghan in slippers for what was supposed to be our daughter and her roommates. Cora rubbed the afghan against her cheek so sweetly, the thought of crocheting another afghan even appealed to me. So as we left that mid-morning amongst hugs and Donna's assurance that we'd be back, we were almost sad to see our host home grow distant in the rear view mirror. When we arrived home after our Christmas in northern Minnesota, we sent Arnie and Cora a check for their hospitality and inconvenience. Our lives went back to our busy pace, and the fact that the check had not cleared the bank was lost on us until we received a letter in the mail in mid-March. In the letter was a clipping from a newspaper and our check surrounded by a sheet of paper with a simple inscription, thank you, you made her so happy, Arnie. It wasn't until we read the obituary that we realized the reason for the gifts and conversation. It was then that we learned that Arnie and Cora had had a daughter, Donna, Donna, her husband Malcolm, and two children lost in a fire preceded Cora in death. As Donna and I held each other and wept for the loss of our special friend, we knew that the journey we made that night was so much more than our desire to be with our daughter. For God had a different idea when we left that night. My prayer since then is that I always be open to the moving of the Holy Spirit as my wife so freely is, and that driving conditions always be good.
It all began sometime in October when Brooke first saw an ad for an Etch-a-Sketch. Mom, I want one of those for Christmas. To which I answered, Brooke, you have got to decide just what all you do want for Christmas. There's a Barbie doll and a car, a paint set, bunny slippers, Play-Doh, crayons, an art easel, and a piano on that list. Why don't you just save your money and buy it yourself? My logical brain thought we would be able to show Brooke the value of a dollar. Brooke took the task of gathering her monies for this Etch-a-Sketch quite seriously. The cushions on the couch had never been inspected for loose change as regularly as they were with Brooke combing every nook and cranny for a spare bit of change. Coat pockets were checked. Under our bed was scrutinized for the possibility of some errant quarter that might be lurking there. Her teenage brothers paid her change for doing their chores. She was on a mission. Despite her best tries, counting and recounting the money she had garnered still left her terribly short. So her father and I decided she would and should be rewarded with an Etch-a-Sketch for Christmas. We smuggled it in, wrapped it for Santa to give her on Christmas morning. Brooke woke us Christmas morning, prodding and rolling us out of bed as she had her brothers, who were now waiting for us in the living room at the Christmas tree. We hurried down in fear of them opening gifts before we even got there. We really wanted to see her face when she opened the Etch-a-Sketch. So we sat, my husband and me on the couch, watching as Brooke opened her Etch-a-Sketch. The paper torn with abandon, she clasped her hand on either side of the screen and held it up for all of us to see and shouted at the top of her voice, it's an Etch-a-Sketch and it was free. We all roared with laughter as we looked at that tear-streaked face, look in awe as she examined her new toy. I was most taken aback by our two boys who also appeared quite misty-eyed, for it was several gifts later that yet another Etch-a-Sketch was unwrapped. This one had been the collective effort of her brothers who later confessed guilt for making her work so hard for nearly no pay. So it was that we were a two Etch-a-Sketch family. We all took our turn on the extra one, seeing who could make the most unique design or follow the lines and not cross over on a maze that we would create. If I were to offer a moral to the story, it would be that Brooke best summed it up when she said, it was free. Our gift at Christmas had a great price for Jesus, but it was given to us freely.
my love. Mine is a farming family. Well, that's to say what we really do. We milk. And every morning at 4 a.m., I have to get up and help my dad milk. I am 15 years old, and getting up is a real drag. Sometimes I lay there after dad has come in to get me up and hear him go out. I give it about 15 minutes, and then I get up because I know he will have the cows in and in their place. Any job I don't have to do, I don't. My family is not big on saying, I love you. I guess it is something we are supposed to just know. But I'm not so sure that I really knew I was loved as much as I knew I was needed to do the work around the farm. So, on that Christmas Eve, when I overheard my parents talking in their bedroom, Dad told Mom, I hate getting Rob up to come out to milk. He never really complains, but I know it would feel good for him to sleep in. Mother reminded him that not getting me up would mean he would be out in the barn even longer and the children would be antsy waiting for him to get finished milking so that they could open their gifts. And dad replied that he would think about that, but he still thought the best gift would be to let me sleep in on Christmas. It was right then and there that I realized my father loved me, and I had not gotten him anything for Christmas. I came up with a plan. I know I did not get any sleep that night as I was looking at the bedside clock. I saw 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 1.30, and finally, at 2 o'clock, I slipped into my clothes, padded down the stairs, put on my jacket, and went out to do something I really did not like. The cows were cooperative, and the milking was done just as I came up to the house, and the bathroom light upstairs went on. Dad always stopped into the bathroom before he woke me up. I slid into my bed just as I heard him pause at my door and then move down the hall and stairs and go outside. Rob, Rob, I heard him say as he shook my shoulder as I lay pretending to be asleep. I couldn't help myself and started to laugh. As I sat up in bed, my father gave me a strong hug. You milked for me today? Confessing, yeah, Dad. I hadn't gotten you anything for Christmas, and I thought you might enjoy the day off. He sat beside me in my bed with his arm around my shoulder and said, I have never seen any of you children wake up on Christmas morning to see the gifts under the tree. You have given me more of a gift than anyone has ever given me. I think I will go down and make a pot of coffee for your mother and wait on the couch for everyone to come down. I think I'll come down with you, Dad. That is where my siblings found us, on the couch, my head on Dad's shoulder, both of us sound asleep. The screeches of my sisters woke us with a start when they saw the gifts and the tree lights on. Dad and I looked at each other, smiled, and he said, I love you, Rob. And I said, I love you, Dad. I love yous came a little easier for both Dad and I. I learned a valuable lesson that morning, the gift of giving even when it hurts, or maybe giving until it feels good.
the present. A friend of mine named Paul received an automobile from his brother as a Christmas present. On Christmas Eve, when Paul came out of his office, a little boy was walking around the shiny new car, admiring it. Is this your car, mister? He asked. Paul nodded. My brother gave it to me for Christmas. The boy was astounded. You mean your brother gave it to you and it didn't cost you nothing? Boy, I wish. And he hesitated. Of course, Paul knew what he was going to wish for. He was going to wish he had a brother like that. But, when the lad, but what the lad said jarred Paul all the way down to his heels. I wish, the boy went on, that I could be a brother like that. Paul looked at the boy in astonishment. Then impulsively, he added, would you like to take a ride in my automobile? Oh, yes, I'd love that. After a short ride, the boy turned and with his eyes aglow said, Mister, would you mind driving in front of my house? Paul smiled a little. He thought he knew what the lad wanted. He wanted to show his neighbors that he could ride home in a big automobile. But Paul was wrong again. Will you stop where those two steps are, the boy asked. The boy ran up the steps. Then in a little while, Paul heard him coming back. But he was not coming fast. He was carrying his little crippled brother. He sat him down on the bottom step, then sort of squeezed up against him and pointed to the car. There she is, buddy, just like I told you upstairs. His brother gave it to him for Christmas, and it didn't cost him a cent. And someday, I'm going to give you one just like it. Then you can see for yourself all the pretty things in the Christmas windows that I've been trying to tell you about. Paul got out and lifted the lad to the front seat of the car. The shiny-eyed older brother climbed in beside him, and the three of them began a memorable holiday ride. That Christmas Eve, Paul learned what Jesus meant when he said, it is more blessed to give.
the adoption. I stitched us together by night in the rocking chair, marveled at your fingers, the foreign navel, memorized the sweep of your eyebrows, unraveled your language. Having accepted the unfamiliar, I kept watch for proof of our union. Tonight, I inhale as I kiss your perfect face, moist from busy dreaming. Your fragrance marks me, that fingerprint only a parent can read. I crawl in beside you, grateful and patient, to dip us in even breath in this night's ink. Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax list. This first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. Everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage, and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly, and laid him in a manger, because there is no place for them in the guest rooms. Nearby, shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angels stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Many committed these things to mem Mary. Oh, excuse me. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. Everything happened 
just as they had been told. That is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Father, it is in this journey that we take to Christmas that we understand that there, the gift that is for us is in the personhood of Christ. That such love would be poured down at Christmas that we should receive what none of us, none of us justly should receive. And yet through adoption, we become children of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for setting down a, a plan that all of the earth should be redeemed. We thank you and we praise you as we give honor and glory to Christ our Lord. Amen. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy and so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly Christ the Savior is born. 